Water is often the lifeblood of any ecosystem. Rainfall and surface water can determine plant life, and thus the herbivores and invertebrate communities, and then the carnivores too. Species that have a major influence on the water flow and retention of areas can play a significant role in the functioning of the ecosystem too. Baroth is well known as the mud brute, a semi-aquatic wyvern typically dependent on wetland areas and oases in the desert. Almadron is a huge and powerful leviathan, with curious abilities in the sodden areas it inhabits. Both seem dependent on not just water, but mud specifically. Let's take a look at why that may be, with some help from our natural world. One habitat the two animals share is the sandy plains, a mixed landscape of arid savanna and true desert, where water is no doubt a precious commodity. Small and seemingly permanent water sources are dotted across the landscape, and it's possible these vital oases are actually made by monsters themselves. American alligators are actually more responsible for the maintenance of the various swamp environments than many people realise. They dig themselves holes in the marsh, and maintain them studiously throughout the year too, and these spots become known as alligator holes. These are considerably deeper than the surrounding wetland, and as such have a greater capacity to hold water. The lengthening and widening processes that the alligators dig into them can mean that in severe droughts, alligator holes can be the only standing water left at the end of the dry season. The actions of Baroth and Almadron may be very similar in environments like the Sandy Plains. Baroth doesn't just rest in the mud, they may actively maintain their water holes with constant wallowing, no doubt making them significantly deeper. It's also not unreasonable to assume that as well as a battering ram for enemies and anthills, Baroth can use its spade-like crown to shovel mud to both deepen and broaden their mires. After all, the more mud the better, and the deeper the mire, the better for Baroth to submerge in during the heat of the day. Almadron may engage in similar processes, albeit using its clawed limbs and massive tail to dig and sweep mud aside and deepen the waterhole, as well as using his weird golden fluid to soften and break up the earth too. It's the same situation for Almadron, in that it only benefits from more mud and deeper water holes, as this will give it more cover to both rest in and hide itself from prey. This is all very well and good for Baroth and Almadron, but how do other animals benefit from these ponds too? Overtly, these water sources will provide a permanent source of water all year round. For large terrestrial animals like Apsaros and Renoplos, this will be a lifesaver, and in turn support carnivores but hosts of tiny animals like birds and insects will also be saved, and likely be completely dependent on such pools and droughts and the tail end of the dry season. The ponds would also be saviours for aquatic life too. With alligator holes, they may well make the difference between life and death for various fish, amphibian and invertebrate species across the wetlands. The presence of Baroth or Almadron in environments like deserts and savannas may mean the same, and allow for a significant increase in the overall biodiversity of the area. A large and unexpected benefactor may be Karupako. As a bird wife and of arid areas that eats fish and other small animals, these ponds may allow for a considerably greater density of Karupako, by both increasing the amounts of their food stocks and how long they last throughout the year. Individuals with chicks could also have greater offspring survival with the amount of mud monsters in their territory. There are a few differences between alligator and baroth or almadron holes, however. In the four characteristics listed, three seem reasonable, but the point about water clarity is definitely where they differ. The two monster species are quite literally known for their mud, and stir up huge amounts of silt in their wallowing. The frequency of this action may be what keeps their ponds from becoming full of plants. The paper mentions that simply the action of movement is enough to sufficiently disturb plant life so as to prevent its regrowth. So the movements of animals far greater in size, as well as their efforts to expand their ponds and their frequent wallowing, should also suffice to keep them vegetation clear. And this is important, especially in shallower ponds. Receding water levels allowing plant growth can make things very disadvantageous for aquatic organisms and then if shallow enough, the whole pond may also risk succession into a vegetated area that will desiccate in future seasons. Overall, it seems the two can have notable impacts on the areas where they choose to dig their ponds. As a relatively common wyvern widespread over a lot of arid regions in the world, Baroth in particular may be a very important ecosystem engineer for arid areas by increasing water retention in them. 
easily as much so as its larger and deadlier rivals, the Blosswivens. They may also leave their mark on habitats in different ways. Baroth's habit of shaking off mud throughout its feeding ventures may shed large quantities of it over time. Whilst the mud likely dries out relatively quickly, it may transport more nutrient-rich soil to the otherwise very barren desert sands, and over time allow for better plant growth. Baroth is also an insectivore, and in the New World at least one of its primary sources of food are the ants that seem to create the titular wild spires in the waste. Baroth's technique in obtaining them doesn't seem to have much finesse, and it seems to simply ram the mounds to break and open them and eat freely from the mess within presumably consuming considerable amounts of dirt alongside the invertebrates themselves. This may not sound ideal, but it's actually something most insectivorous animals are used to. After all, they also ingest large quantities of indigestible chitin with the insects. It seems a lot of insectivores actually get diarrhea without consuming earth, chitin or something similar with their food, and it often has to be added to their zoo diets to permit more natural digestion. Despite an unusual diet, Baroth may not be so different from other brute wyverns on the inside. In some aspects, the stomachs of certain insectivores are actually quite similar to those of carnivorans. Baroth may even have a trick up its sleeve for even more nutrition too, as some pangolins may have the ability to at least partially digest chitin for extra carbohydrates. The desert-dwelling Baroth could be similar to eke out more nutrients in a harsh environment. Baroth may not be a pure or obligate mimecophage, though, and as well as other insects, it may occasionally dabble in tackling other forms of protein too. More generalist insectivores, like some types of armadillo, will occasionally scavenge carrion, or predate small animals. And Baroth may be no different. Among other things, true mimecophages are often characterised by low metabolisms, small territories and short feeding spans at patches. It's possible Baroth may have a lower metabolism than other brute wyverns, but as a large and active animal, it likely snacks on other sources of protein every now and then, when allowing its regular patches of ants to regenerate. It's worth noting too, even obligate mimecophages will still occasionally eat other sources of protein with enthusiasm. So either way, Baroth may occasionally help itself to jaggy, shepherd hairs or gaiju. Much like other insectivores, Baroth may also be an opportunist. When presented with multiple sources of food, it consumes the most common one and this changes throughout the year with Baroth's diet following suit. As for other invertebrates, in the old world a primary chunk of Baroth's diet may well be Alteroth. The Alteroth's own generalist diet of fungi, honey and other nutrient-rich items, as well as their larger size, may also mean that eating other vertebrates is less frequent in the old world, due to Alteroth providing better quality sustenance. Another interesting difference between Old and New World Baroth is the lack of aggressive territoriality. In the Old World, Baroths are said to fight savagely for territory, especially at the end of the dry season. Males ram each other with bulldozer-like heads to determine a winner, and the cranial wounds inflicted can be fatal. The winner also takes the resident female, and potentially more than one too. But it's said this doesn't happen in the New World, and this might be to do with the different ecosystems. Large areas of the arid regions of the Old World aren't fed by springs, but by rainfall. Once the rainy season ends, water becomes a limited resource that continues to disappear. In short, it becomes something worth fighting for. In the Wild Spire, though, this region is fed by permanent springs in the rock. The constant flow of water allows for the creation of large marsh areas. They may also be expanded further by Baroth and Juratodus. Even in the driest season, they still have a constant supply of fresh water, and this may also result in better insect densities. There is actually evidence of a similar phenomenon in jaguars. In the flooded forests of the Brazilian Pantanal, the big cats eat mainly fish and caiman, both of which are very abundant. As a result of such rich resources, territories between the cats break down, and they live at the highest densities of jaguars anywhere in the world. Normally, the males of big cats are hostile to one another, but the jaguars here will hunt and rest together, even the adult males. The rich, spring-fed marshes of the wild spire may cause an increase in the food stocks of invertebrates and a permanent water supply to keep the muddy mires topped up that causes a similar territorial breakdown in Baroth, also leading to a very high density of them in the wild spire. Baroth aren't the only large monsters in such arid regions, though and they share their habitat with Diablos in the New World, as well as likely Monoblos in the Old World. 
Despite the titanic strength and famed belligerence of these wyverns, one struggle they can't brute force their way through is against invertebrates. The World Book mentions a secret war in the desert, where neither of the combatants seem aware of the conflict they're embroiled in, nor of their opponent. Diablos's greatest rival are ants, who gnaw away at their cactus patches, consuming and withering the plants. Surely with this, it would make evolutionary sense for Diablos to at least try to be more lenient towards anteating Baroff to ensure a better crop of cacti. Well, it's hard to say. Termites, who seem analogous to the wild spire ants with the castles of clay they build, can have significant impacts on the savannah. These can be far-reaching, especially when in conjunction with other ecological aspects like fire and large herbivores. But it does seem their presence can change soil composition, and lead to better plant diversity among other impacts. So large numbers of them may well be beneficial for the giant herbivores of the desert. Baroth probably doesn't destroy the wild spires permanently, or it would have no food source. But it may limit their numbers and impacts, potentially reducing cactus and other desert plant crops. Blosswive and hostility may be deserved towards Baroth, then. Although it's much more likely there's a simpler explanation of Blosswivens naturally being hostile to anything shaped like a brute wyvern, there's no doubt the relationship between Diablos, Ants, Baroth, and Cacti is a fascinating and nuanced one that would be ripe for further study and exploration. It's also not like Baroth doesn't give as good as he gets, and he is savagely territorial over his own wallows as Diablos is over the whole desert. In the event of Moto Moto not liking you, Baroth will pursue aggression to the point of killing smaller monsters like Great Jaggy. But interestingly, this hostility doesn't extend to herbivores like Aptonoth, at very least. This may be because Baroth can potentially benefit from their presence. Herbivores leave dung, and insects like that. As well as flies and dung beetles, termites can also readily consume herbivore dung. So maybe wild spire ants, alteroth, or other monster hunter insects do so as well. By making their water holes a safer spot for herbivores, it may also help maintain their food stocks as well. As an insectivore, a question that may arise from this is why doesn't Baroth live in more fertile regions like rainforests, where massive densities of hornitors and other invertebrates would provide good and constant fare? There are a variety of possible answers for this, and one could be that it's the wrong type of food. Baroth seemingly relies, at least partially, on its food sources having large, easily detectable homes it can regularly visit. If hornitors and their larvae especially are a scattered resource usually hidden in the leaf litter, Baroth may not have tools as efficient as other insectivores to utilise the most abundant prey. Yan Kutku, with its fine hearing, is likely much better at foraging for hornitors and their larvae, as well as for conchu. It's often important to remember in competition it isn't just fighting at the dinner table. It can be how effectively you use resources compared to your competitors. Another reason could be that the predation of neonates could be too high. Baroth seem reasonable parents from their description, with both the male and female building a flamingo-like nest in the middle of their ponds, and then laying between 10 and 20 eggs in it. They guard this together, and baby Baroth are similar to their parents on hatching, only much smaller. There would be sufficient mud in any rainforest for nest materials, but the density of small carnivores that would raid nests and pick off the chicks would be considerably higher in the rainforest than in the desert. There could also be a barrier of habitat inaccessible to Baroth that prevents them from reaching rainforest areas. The area of cooler temperate woodland and grassland may not have sufficient insect numbers or adequate habitat to support Baroth in the transition from arid savanna to jungle. The requirement for wallows may also limit them even in desert habitats too. The canyon rivers and deep aquifers seen in some parts of the desert may seem ideal, but the clear deep water would be poor for breeding, as well as supporting Baroth's lifestyle. The relatively permanent presence of Plesioth in these water sources would also make them inadequate, with even adult Baroth standing little chance against the huge water wyvern. It's worth noting too that Baroth isn't dependent on water so much as it is on mud. Large deep lakes and clear fast-flowing rivers may effectively be useless to it, and it has certain habitat preferences for its pond. Its ability to dig and enlarge them means that it can create a small wallow into a proper water body. But whilst it's tempting to compare its habitat needs to something like a hippopotamus, Baroth clearly has a somewhat stricter set of needs. The exact need for mud is unknown, but it's been suggested parasite protection and avoiding hot daytime temperatures are possible reasons. 
Both seem quite likely, as Baroth may be limited in nocturnal behaviours to avoid more nocturnal predators or competitors like Anjanath or Diablos. Their presence at night may ultimately force it into daytime activity, limiting its range to be close to its wallows where it can regularly cool off, or reapply a thick coat of mud to protect itself from the sun. Despite apparently living in the mountains, Almadron is well built for a semi-aquatic lifestyle, and resembles an elongated otter. One not especially mammalian trait it possesses though are barbels, which form its beard. In catfish these can perform as physical sensors, but are primarily used for taste, likely to detect if solid objects are prey or not in the thick murk. As a more predatory organism that also forages in murky water, it could be possible they function similar to an otter's whiskers as well. The whiskers of aquatic carnivores are important tools for foraging, as a lot of it is done in either shallow or murky water. As well as water disturbances, it's also suggested they may act as a sonar net to detect invertebrates auditory signals. This may be a form of hunting Almadron seasonally engages in too. Both the Mudmasters' lives will be ruled by the seasons. As a more predatory animal, Almadron may not be able to rely on profitable prey coming to their waterholes in rainy periods. The large amount of surface water allows animals to find it elsewhere, but it may also provide Almadron with an alternative source of food. Ephemeral streams that spring up can form an important source of food for otter species. While otters are often imagined like pinnipeds with legs, swimming after large fish at high speeds in deep water, a number of more terrestrial species forage more like raccoons or badgers, rummaging in the water of shallow streams to find crustaceans, with very little actual swimming. Such prey can also form the bulk of otter diet for some species, far more important than the fish they're typically associated with. Amphibians such as toads are also an important resource for numerous populations for large portions of the year, again more so than the traditional idea of otter diet. As can prey like water birds be too, typically taken in smaller ponds spread across larger areas than the pure lakes and rivers we associate otters with. This shows us the typical view we can have of an animal doesn't always match up to the different methods it can use to survive in the varying habitats across their broad ranges. Almadron may be the same. Much like otters and baroth, it's likely a seasonal opportunist, swapping diet and terrain with rainfall and the amount of standing water in the areas it lives in. In rainier seasons, it may hunt overland in shallow streams, with prey like young hermitors and cenotors being an important food source for it. Only when the ephemeral water has dried up does it retreat to its wallow to act more like a crocodile, waiting for large prey items to come down through its water source so they can be ambushed. It's unknown but seems possible that Tetranodon and Tetsukabra may undergo aestivation in the mud, especially for Tetranodon as the plants growing on its shell seem to suggest long periods of dormancy. As the dry season sets in, in areas where they overlap, Almadron may be an important predator of the giant amphibians, slowly trawling the muddy floors of their pools with their barbels for the faintest chemical traces of respiration from a dormant amphibian before digging out the sleeping monster for at least a week's worth of meat. Almadron range over a large number of habitats, from subtropical forest to mountain to arid savanna to typical wetland. Over this broad range, it likely uses a diverse suite of foraging tactics for a multitude of possible prey items. This also suggests, unlike Baroth, it's less dependent on mud, and more so on water in general. It can likely also use river and lake ecosystems much more effectively too, but then, what's the mud for? We see Almadron's weaponizing of it isn't random. The huge waves of it are likely just a feature from its ability to excavate water holes. But one of the most puzzling abilities is the fact it can both roll and hold a pretty perfect sphere of mud, that's also firm enough not to just melt away by the tail. This comes from the Japanese art of Doradango, of forming and then polishing a ball of mud to get it as perfectly spherical and shiny as you can. But there are also natural organisms that do something similar that may give us more clues as to Almadron's ecology. Dung beetles are famous for the balls of dung they roll, but whilst everyone can recognise the classic image of one committing to the Sisyphean task of rolling one around, not everyone may know the reason for this behaviour. These balls are known as brood balls, and are typically, but not always, made by the male of the species as a gift to the female for her to lay eggs into. Once hatched, the larvae then eat the ball. This seems like a reason as good as any for Almadron's unique ball rolling. 
and also the fact it can pick up and carry said ball around. As said before, the lives of such animals are ruled by the seasons, and this may be a defence against water holes drying up. It's unknown if Almadron's skin is vulnerable to cracking or parasites without dampening, or if their young require water, but either way, this allows them to transport their offspring either hatched or unhatched to larger or extant water sources if their starts to dry up. This also seems like a likely reason for the golden fluid that apparently dissolves solid land. The reason for this may be both to keep the ball at a constant level of moisture for offspring survival, but also if the brood ball needs more substrate added to it in the journeys between water bodies. It may also be laden with a toxic chemical to repel predators and parasites. This may also suggest relatively minor sexual dimorphism between the two genders as well. As in dung beetles, once a partner is selected, both genders will participate in rolling the ball. Almadron parents may take it in turns to carry the ball in overland journeys between water, or one may care for it while the other forages. There are of course differences still. The brood ball may only be formed after the courtship rather than before, like with dung beetles, and it's primarily for offspring shelter over food. But there may be a few more suggestions dung beetles can give us. It's tempting to suggest from this analogy that Almadron may be relatively R selected. Having a lot of small young in the balls as many would assume dung beetles do. But this may not be the case. A certain type of dung beetle, Kepa nigroensis, has the longest parental care period of any insect. This may not sound like a lot. You may be thinking it looks after it for 5 minutes instead of 4. But it looks after its larva for 12 weeks. And even madder, that's larva singular, as the female only lays a single egg and has a single offspring. During this period, the mother tends to the brood ball of dung, keeping it clear of fungi, preventing desiccation, and protecting both dung and larva from any interloping insects as well. And this works, with the beetles having an 84% success rate at rearing their single larva to adulthood. It's not a complete all your eggs in one basket scenario though. For the first third of the reproductive cycle, the female is also ready to breed again at any moment, should anything happen to the brood ball. Whilst Kefir may have the most intensive parental care, parental care full stop is actually quite widely spread among the dung beetles, and dung beetles may be every bit as deserving of giving you the warm fuzzies as other parents in nature, and maybe Almadron too. As large-bodied, long-lived animals, it's not unreasonable that they may have a smaller number of offspring that they have an extended body of parental care for. Maybe like Kepa nigroensis, it could even have just a single hatchling. This is a lot of speculation, as rise monsters don't have anywhere near as much info on them as older monsters or ones appearing in world, or both. But I hope Almudron was a good start on the first of their unique roster. And all of these were just a few possible theories on the unique animals whose lives are so thoroughly submerged in mud, glorious mud. For my thoughts on both monsters, to start, I love Baroth. Until Anjanath, he was head and shoulder my favourite brute wyvern and monster I was most excited to fight in Tri when it first arrived. And for many, he was quite a wall in that game too. Nowadays, he feels more like the Kutku tier, even if he's at the higher end of it which does feel inevitable, but I wouldn't mind him getting some meat back in later games. His fight isn't bad, but he could definitely do with a few more moves to keep people on their toes, especially now that he's appearing in more recent games. Design-wise, I think he's great. I love the almost slight xenomorph vibe I get with him with how small the eyes are and how you often can't see them from certain angles. Combined with his ecology, it all just fits together very nicely to make Baroth a great early game monster. With Almadron, one thing it made me realise is what a shame Rice's lack of difficulty was, in that with its unique monsters that they never got the chance to feel intimidating. Maybe they'll come back in later games to smack us into submission, but for most of them they really started as pushovers. That said, I know some struggled with Almadron, and some absolutely hate him. He seems quite a polarising monster. Overall, I'd say I like him. More leviathans are always nice, and his very mammal-like design makes him stand out. I wish he was a bit more on the Ludroth side of things and was more chunky and robust like an actual otter. Right now he looks like he can be tied in a knot, but overall he's still pretty good. Fight-wise in Rise is a bit tragic as the wirebug can really make him look like a bit of a joke, and his whole mudbending thing is pretty excessive. He also probably has the best new turf war in Rise, not that there's many to choose from, and I generally thought he was actually going to kill Bishantan in it too. 
Overall, yeah, he's decent, and one of the better additions to Rise as well. Thanks for watching, and for the positive comments on the last video. There was a lot of discussion of dragon and dragon elements, and some points worth bringing up too. Eight-legged fiends pointed out a diaphragm is a uniquely mammalian structure, and if elders or at least Kushela may use unidirectional breathing like birds. I should have specified a few things regarding elders in my video, that one, I believe them to be tetrapods, but still their own heavily derived group, separate to other phyla. And of course, as said in World, they're not a true taxa, but a common name for effectively unidentified but very powerful species. I do think at least a handful of them are related to some extent, like Teostra, Kushala, and Nergigante, but that's quite a headache to try and work out. Raptor X863 also pointed out that Camellios does drop minerals as shinies, and so may have some biomineralization going on too. While it's not as ore thirsty as something like Kushala that would need large amounts of it for its metal plating, Camellios likely engages in both mineral consumption and biomineralization just like a lot of other elders. There was a ton of interesting comments on Dragon Element, of it being sequestered in the ground, in plants, in other animals. Far too many to go over, but a lot of great theories, and I thank all of you for them. As well as just commenting in general. By all means keep them coming, and if you're not already, consider joining the Discord too for more discussion. Thank you of course to all subscribers too, as I indeed hit 1000 subs. We're now 980 higher than I thought this channel would ever get. And if AdSense let me, I can even monetize too. We're millionaires, boys. I'll share it with all of you. I don't think this channel will ever get truly massive, as I've said before. It's too stuffy and technical by my own making for that. But it's very cool to see so many people interested. Now that I'm also a mega massive YouTube king, I can recommend other content too. A huge thanks to Glide Borealis for allowing me to use footage from his own series in this video. He has a set of slick and very well made short documentaries about the assorted beasts of Monster Hunter World, all made with in-game footage from their natural behaviours, as well as additions of cutscenes without the pesky hunter in the way, and scenic, well composed snippets of the monsters chilling in their natural habitats. A link is provided in the description so you can check out his fantastic content for yourself. Next up, Monster Hunter Jacob is another small channel who makes some really interesting content. His recent video on the changing mood of Monster Hunter games I found excellent. He made some points that really change how I evaluate different aspects of the games, like how in earlier gens the music cheered on the monster over the hunter, and the dissonance between the hunt and the village leading to a greater sense of peace at home and drama on the hunt, as well as the greater atmosphere some of the older maps have. Yes indeed, bring back the fog. He also has tours of the excellent first gen maps, so you can check them out for yourself whilst waiting for the next video. And of course, here's the teaser for it.